Thank you. <laughs> and, we move, and we move straight on to our next panel, Innovative Markets, Innovative Business. Um, we will have um, the Minister by connection, but perhaps the other four could come and join us. Michael Leonidas Christopoulos, Yanis Miserlis, Kostas Agzarioliu, and yeah, hi. <laughs> Hi, Michael. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Um, if, Minister, if Minister Frago Giannis is online, I think you have the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, dear friends, I'm delighted to be part of the sixth annual London Business Summit that will focus on UK, Greece, Cyprus, taking trade and investment to the next level. Even though my recent uh, positive COVID uh, kept me at home, uh, what I'm standing off at the moment and did not permit my coming to London, which I initially intended to do. Um, I'm also greatly humbled to have been chosen as your guest of honor and keynote speaker on innovative markets, innovative business. And I will take this opportunity to talk a little about the Astipalia project, I'll buy it virtually. Perhaps you have never heard of Astipalia. It's a small Greek island of only 11 miles maximum length and eight miles maximum width with a year round population of just 1300. The island is part of the Dodecanese archipelago, many of you may know, or you may have visited Rhodes, which is the greatest of the islands. Despite its previous obscurity, the Ovastipalia has recently become known throughout the world. When Googled, the word Astipalia yields close to 600,000 results, whereas Astipalia Volkswagen turns up close to 50,000. The Astipalia project has been featured on NBC, uh, Bloomberg, uh, ABC, Reuters, Al Jazeera, Deutsche Welle, Die Welt, and even Jakarta Post, the Hindu and Bangkok Post, and of course, The Economist. So what is the Astipalia project and why is it so critically important? Initially, I would like to stress that the Astipalia project is of great significance for Greece, not because it will change the world. Truth be said, the island is just too small. Its footprint is too negligible anyway, and its capacity to make a difference to climate change, very limited. Of course, it would be wonderful if it were otherwise, but surely this project does act as an experimental prototype that will allow for important conclusions on electric mobility in general to be drawn. As a matter of fact, two universities, one Greek and one British, are already jointly conducting important research on how the island will transition to this new reality and how this is being received by the local population. However, its real importance lies elsewhere. The project has become somewhat of a symbol of change, a paradigm shift, if I may use this term, usually used when talking about schools of thought or philosophy. And this is because the Smart and Sustainable Island project marked the beginning of a new era for Greece. In recent past, on the verge of Brexit, and still feeling the consequences of a 10-year financial crisis you all know about. Having Volkswagen cast a vote of confidence to do business and invest in Greece in late 2020, seemed to have had somewhat of a snowball effect on foreign direct investments for the country as a whole. During this period, I mean since this government won the elections in 2019, Greece attracted an array of global giants that chose the country for colossal investments, including Pfizer, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, JP Morgan, Deloitte, Digital Realty, and Cisco. Meanwhile, all of this was happening despite the unprecedented consequences of the worldwide pandemic. Actually, apart from the Greek government's commendable handling of this extreme situation, the pandemic accelerated Greece's successful digital transformation. And we went from a, being a country plugged by messy bureaucratic procedures to one where 1,300 government services are now available online. As fellow Minister Kyriakos Pierakakis, also on this panel, will verify, we went from 8.8 .8 million recorded digital transactions in 2018 to over 500 million in 2021. Both the number of investments and their size and the face of a different crisis and friendly government had another consequence as well. 
trust in the government has been restored as the Greek people are seeing things getting done. After decades of viewing almost everything through the spectrum of suspicion, Greece and its citizens now have the mindset that allows us to face global challenges and embrace change. That is why the Smart and Sustainable Island project on Astipala is of such great significance. It is actually a snapshot of the future today, a smart ecosystem centered on the electric vehicle. The project is ongoing and will be fully implemented in the next few years. So after Astipalia was selected as the site for this project due to its size, small enough to be cost efficient, large enough to be measurable, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the Greek government and Volkswagen Group. In early June of last year, the project's launch was held in the presence of the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis and Volkswagen Chief Executive Officer Dr. Herbert Dees. At this time, the first electric vehicles for public use by the island's police, civil aviation, port police and municipality were donated. A state-of-the-art electric ambulance, the first of its kind in the world, will arrive on the island in a couple of months when the on-demand shuttle service will also be officially launched. What the project is creating is an entirely new transport system, which will result in the island achieving zero emissions mobility by 2030. Conventionally fueled commercial vehicles on the island are currently being replaced as the island citizens are receiving general subsidies to do so on a digital platform. In total, roughly 1,000 electric vehicles will take the place of about 1,500 vehicles that are now powered by conventional combustion engines. At the same time, a total of more than close to 200 charging points will be put in the, in the island, many of them already having been installed. The first participants are already driving their electric cars on the department. In addition, an all-electric year-round ride-sharing service will be offered by completely revamping their current limited local bus service. The traditional vehicle rental business will also be transformed into a vehicle sharing service offering e-scooters, e-bikes and electric cars. Finally, autonomous driving will be tested on the island in the future, given the available technology. In parallel, the Greek government is helping the island transition to complete energy autonomy through the use of renewable energy technologies, such as wind and solar power, since Estipalia possesses a significant untapped green energy potential. Renewable energy sources alone will cover the additional electricity demand arising from the introduction of immobility now powered by diesel generators. By 2023, a new solar park will provide about three megawatts of green energy and by 2026, the new energy system will be further expanded to more than 80% of the total energy demand of the island. In addition, a battery storage system will help to balance the grid and make full use of the solar park. As a result, CO2 emissions of Astipalia's energy system will be minimized, while energy costs are to be falling down by 25% at least. The commitment of the local community to achieving the sustainable development goals of the project is of equal importance and further evidence of the new Greek mindset that I mentioned earlier. In a nutshell, as transport-related greenhouse gas emissions are one of the key drivers of climate change, sustainable initiatives such as this one I briefly described are very welcome. There are surely concrete evidence of our commitment to the Paris Accord. Greece has decidedly moved towards an era of economic transformation, innovation, and sustainable development. The Astipalia project is just one of many examples of the new Greece. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. And now, um, Leonidas Christopoulos. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for having me here, especially uh, in this day, which is a very important day for us in the Ministry of Digital Governance, since uh, we have birthday, it's our birthday, uh, GovGR, the single digital gateway uh, today is two years old, uh, together with 1,300, uh, more than 1,300 services that we have digitalized uh, throughout the past two years in the Ministry, and we hope that we've, we've done your lives easier. Uh, so today it's our birthday. Um, and uh, of course I'm honored to be uh, part of this summit and of this partner particularly since um, I, I, I deeply, I profound, it's my profound belief that innovation and especially digital innovation uh, based on digital technologies uh, is the solid foundation of economic development, especially in developed countries. 
And uh, as I suppose we all know that uh, innovation is vital to economic development since it has this ability to have spillover effects throughout the economy, throughout uh, all areas uh, of the economy, and that sustain long-term productivity growth. In that respect, innovation and innovation based on digital technologies does not only push scientific knowledge towards one area, but it also transforms the everyday uh, business environment in which we operate in which profits are made, and of course it creates new opportunities and market ideas. Just imagine that in recent, in recent years we have witnessed a rapid increase in technological innovation, uh, both in markets and the government. We have trends like the crypto assets, the fintech, the insurtech, micro lending, regtech, govtech, and they all have integrated new technologies in financial and regulatory services and products and have undoubtedly been boosted by the pandemic. So it is as very vital for, for governments and policymakers to respond to these trends by improving traditional tools, tools that we already had in our disposal, and by creating new innovative ones for supporting and facilitating the process of innovation and digital transformation and protecting citizens at the same time. Um, so let me briefly say what I believe governments should be focusing on regarding their governance methods, and then I'll turn to Greece. Uh, to describe what we've done on that respect. Uh, first and foremost, governments must be able to quickly assess the environment and the trends and identify uh, risks and opportunities in the changing landscape. Uh, you know that technology moves rapidly. Uh, we already have in Greece uh, a foresight exercise, a special structure that does foresight exercises to see where we're going to be uh, in, in the decades to come, but apart from that we need to also assess the environment for the new technologies. Secondly, and perhaps, perhaps more importantly uh, on our side, governments should use all available regulatory tools uh, in order to reduce barriers to innovation, especially in emerging technologies like, a, like AI and blockchain, uh, protecting again uh, public interest. And in my opinion, a good regulatory environment uh, is an environment that has a little regulation and a regulation that can quickly adapt to the changing uh, environments. Um, a regulation that can ensure that governance structures and core services of the state, regulations, enforcement mechanisms are capable to adapt quickly in order to be fit for the moment and the future and to be able to follow this new normality that we're all facing. Uh, and thirdly, governments should reevaluate the innovation initiative portfolio and ensure resources that are allocated, are allocated pro appropriately via mechanisms that are fit for the ecosystem that is being generated in the sphere of digital innovation. Now, taking these three pillars into account, the Greek government since 2019 ha had al uh, already had a plan to move forward with those above mentioned issues and it has done so in a, in a very rigorous way. Even though Greece has a limited market size, which means it is hard for small or medium innovative businesses to find the necessary critical mass in their home country alone, there seems to be a favorable, uh, favorable environment in the sense that innovative companies tend to think internationally in Greece nowadays. Uh, there are a lot of resources coming from the European uh, Union as funds for digital innovation and digital transformation. And as the Minister said earlier, the Minister of Finance, there is a rather stable financial environment and a more attractive uh, track, uh, tax environment. So what we're doing is the following. Uh, we're trying to become uh, a data-driven economy. We're trying uh, to, to um, regulate and to create the environment uh, and the mechanisms to facilitate the reuse of certain public sector data that cannot be made available as open data and measures to ensure that data intermediaries will function as trustworthy organizers of data sharing or pooling within the common European data spaces where we were one of the first countries to adopt the European Directive on uh, Open Data and we'll do the same on the Data Governance Act that is currently being in the European Parliament. Secondly, become a skillful economy by supporting the upskilling of everybody and especially the SMEs. And uh, the third one is to create a network of hubs uh, that can become uh, a one-stop shop for all companies and entrepreneurs, providing them an end-to-end -end experience in their digitalization journey. 
Regarding the area of regulations, since the new government took office in summer 2019, it has tried to improve the regulatory framework and the way we do regulations in general. We have tried to inject a bit more Anglo-Saxonic uh, parameters in our system, uh, if you like, in order to make it more flexible. Uh, for example, by creating a regulatory committee, both by uh, legal experts and economists, that was not the case earlier in, uh, in Greece, uh, to assess the quality of regulations and to make them more flexible. And in that respect, we have codified and we have created just one legal instrument for digital governance and telecommunication in Greece. We don't need more. We'll have one more for the new technologies for blockchain and AI in the future, but we just, want, we just have one law that gathers everything, that, ga that gathers our cloud-first policy, that gathers our telecommunications policy, that gathers the new coordinative mechanisms and the governance policy, that sets up institutions to support innovation. And that has contributed, in my, in my uh, belief, uh, to attracting all these investments that have come to Greece during the last two years. You heard about the Microsoft, uh, uh, JP Morgan that uh, uh, had uh, Viva Wallet, uh, Amazon that came to Greece, and uh, all these, um, uh, this environment. Lastly, uh, regarding the third area, we have supported or designed various innovative tools to improve access to finance. Finance, uh, because time is out, I'm just gonna um, uh, say about one of them. It is the 5G uh, venture, uh, I say, which is a public company. That what we've tried to do is use the money from the auction, part of the money, 25% of the money from the 5G auction, in order to support the ecosystem that is uh, actually the small businesses, European or national ones, that are actually do, are having to do with the ecosystem of the 5G startups and SMEs. Uh, so this fund has now almost 100 million and is starting to support the ecosystem that uses 5G technologies uh, for. Uh, uh, for, from the demand side, and we also um, give out uh, for part of the spectrum of the 5G spectrum for, for free to companies, research uh, uh, entities, universities in order to produce new products. And finally, these companies can have their proof of concept on uh, government entities, and then the government entities can use these products for one year for free. It is a new relationship between the innovative ecosystem of Greece and the public administration. My final message, and to, to close my intervention, is that Greece has come a long way since 2019 when we came into government, when the government of Kyriakos Mitsotakis uh, took office. And we have managed to fix a lot of broken things in our society and our economy uh, that were actually, as the minister said earlier, deteriorated the trust both of markets and citizens. Uh, we're now moving forward with something that Greece, at least at the governmental side, never really had in the past. And that is that we're trying to think out of the box in the government in order to support ideas, to support innovation. And I think that that is the main message that I can convey to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael, I think you're next. Oh, good. <laughs> Ecom. Yeah. Ecom bot. Oh, um, what about yes, uh, I'm a sponsor, so I'm sitting on the chair here. <laughs> so, um, basically, I wish I could, um, I could be the bearer of good news that I always like to have a bit of a conversation with uh, the panel and the people regarding progress that's happening in, in the global sphere, in the economic sphere, in the banking industry where we come from, and the fintech or regtech technological uh, infrastructure that's happening on overall. Unfortunately, with the things which are happening currently around us, as we all know, nothing is working according to a nice, polished system that is meant to be doing a tick and a talk that is actually predicted, and you can have long-term planning or even long-term strategy. Having said that, um, we have, uh, we have seen small projects that are being run across different countries, um, including Cyprus, which I think we're here today to represent uh, an Eastern, the Eastern Front of the European Union, as we always do every year, with Cyprus and Greece and, uh, and uh, reaching out of the UK. But the problem is that we talk about small projects, like we just spoke by all means about Astibalia, which is a really nice project. I've, I've actually been to Astibalia. I don't know if any of you have been there. 
the, the road network here still needs a lot of work, though. So we're talking about electric cars going on a road network that still needs a lot of work. But that is not what I'm trying to judge here. What I'm trying to say is that we have a small project running on a very minute and a very small destination in Greece, while the overall infrastructure is still, um, let's say, it's rusted paint. And I'm not talking about Greece. I'm talking about Europe overall. I'm talking about Cyprus. We're talking about a country uh, or a region uh, that is actually on the outskirts of the European Union that is just being demonized about whatever happens, just whiplash after whiplash. Today in Cyprus, things are happening which are still detrimental to the economic system of the island and have been predicted and actually been called for a while now. And, you know, we were actually saying, oh, this is not going to happen. Uh, the, 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 the shrinking of the Cyprus banking industry. Well, I think today we're witnessing even a bigger danger to that. You're talking about an island which is uh, on the eastern front of Europe. We have very little infrastructure. We have very little support. We have um, half of our island gone. And uh, I mean, I don't want to be a bit graphical here, but the question is a country that is trying to generate revenue with an inflated currency being going around is trying to invest in tourism. Well, where did the money come from? Let's demonize that. Then we're trying to, inver to invest in the banking infrastructure. Well, why are the banks becoming so big and so plethoric? Let's demonize that. Um, and then we're talking about giving residencies and passports or whatever visas there are. Well, that small island is getting money that we don't understand. Let's demonize that. So what am I trying to say? Is that a Cyprus issue or is that minor, minute issue that is happening on the eastern front of the European Union, just a sample of what's happening basically in the rest of the world and Europe as well. So are the Cyprus banks the only ones which are suffering the credit risk and the credit crunch? Is uh, Cyprus the only country that is uh, suffering now from the blow that's happening from, uh, from, the, uh, from the east with, uh, with the Russians? Uh, is Cyprus the only one which has rusted paints to its infrastructure? We have an old network system that is now approximately 20, 30 years old that needs to be repolished. We have old hotels which are just rusted paint and they're repaying their loans and they're prolonging their loans to the banks just to freshen them up and nothing new is being built. I mean, I'm staying in the top hotels where I go in Europe, which they're five-star hotels. And you know what? It's rusted paint. So, sorry, I speak too fast, so I need to top up on the fuel. So the question is, are we actually doing something that has to do with long-term planning or long-term strategy, and we're uh, anticipating and tackling issues that have to do with inflation, that have to do with two-speed Europe, that have to do with the infrastructure of globalization, or are we just hiding behind our fingers and waiting for something to explode? And then I come to my industry. Have a look at our website. If you need anything that has to do with fintech and bank accounts, please come to us. <laughs> Jokes aside, then we come to our industry. We're a company that's trying to do innovation in Cyprus in terms of fintech. And as soon as we start going and reaching out to the rest of the world, the first thing we have to prove is that we're not elephants. I mean, that we're not the odd ones out. Uh, the first thing we have to prove is that we're innocent because we're from Cyprus. So how do you feed European Union countries to feed innovation and to feed new industries and new branching out, whether that's to the banking, to the tourism, or whatever else it is, when it comes from the suburbs of the centralized governance and they're just being demonized that they're either doing something dodgy, it's Russian money, it's American money, it's Miami, or whatever else there is. I mean, what was my, Miami built on the other day? I'm, I'm wondering, where did they get that money to build Miami? Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm saying again, what's happening with the Scandinavian countries? What's happening with their tax system? Why are we not learning anything out of that? Why are we not learning that happy people are productive people? Why don't we understand that maybe we should revisit how we assess uh, uh, the, the, the GDP of a country and all the indices that have to do with performance and output. I see these things which are actually, it's too many things that I've touched here, but there's too many things going on in my skull, in my head, that it's going to crack open at some point, trying to understand how this world works. And I don't know, being the generation that's now getting on the steering wheel of different companies, 
it really doesn't make sense of how things are still being measured and being operated on a global scale. So are we looking at globalization, and I'll end with this, or are we looking at creating specialization and creating variation, creating variety, encouraging variety, encouraging the European or the Mediterranean hospitality, encouraging Greece to be what it used to be and to have those people which are uh, hospitable and to have those traditional restaurants and taverns and things that people want to see and the tourist product as well. We're killing it at the same time, but at the same time we say, no, you guys focus on tourist product and uh, if you do anything else, you're gonna be penalized. So, a lot of questions there. I hope I get some questions from you back, which are going to make more sense of what I just said. So thank you. Certainly a lot of big issues. <laughs> Yanis Miserlis from Imperio. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Well, it's difficult to follow Michael's uh, remarks, which were full of innovation. And this panel is about innovative business, but real estate is one of the least innovative businesses out there one of the least innovative industries. Um, the way we build and sell real estate has changed very little since the 80s. Um, having said that, the pandemic did act as a disruptor to the industry and helped accelerate some trends that would otherwise take many years. For example, the office market. It is now generally acceptable that work from home is part of uh, normal operations of any company. Globally, this trend tends to shrink the office. In places like Cyprus, however, where the weather is nice and the cities tend to be no, so, not so densely populated, the office sector is seeing increased demand from companies who wish to relocate or open regional offices. So there is an opportunity in the office market in Cyprus right now. The design and construction of sustainable buildings is another trend that has been accelerated in the past two years because of the pandemic. Climate change is now a key driver for real estate. Those investors and landlords who do not invest in sustainable buildings will find out soon that their properties with higher carbon footprint will be facing the risks to depreciate in value and become obsolete in the next two years. These buildings may also suffer from increased operational expenses, maintenance costs, high insurance costs, and lack of financing as more investors, tenants, and financial institutions move towards sustainable real estate. In the residential sector, we've seen organized communities with a number of amenities, communal facilities, and a lot of greenery to be crisis-proof. Millennials and today's buyers are simply not happy with purchasing an apartment in the middle of the city which provides uh, with good accommod accommodation. They're asking for more. And we've seen that greenery, a business center probably within the community that would allow for work from home, gym and other sports facilities are in high demand. Student housing remains a big opportunity in Cyprus and especially in places like Nicosia and Limassol where most of the universities are located. With the end of the pandemic and the return of the students back to universities and back to student halls, the market is expected to pick up and the lack of supply of custom built units to resurface. Finally, being in a place like Cyprus, you can never rule out the opportunities in real estate that relate to tourism. The current pandemic has had an impact on markets and societies and has proven once again that real estate is a sector mostly driven by human behavior. The key to success in real estate today is flexibility. As more developers, investors and professionals must now adapt to the new market demand and current trends. Those who will choose not to adapt will be facing significant risks and low profitability, while their projects may be obsolete and unable to be occupied. Thank you. Costas, um, uh, John, I'll, uh, in order to put a balance in the mode of uh, presentation, I'll use the podium so that it <laughs> inclusivity, right? Yeah. Uh, 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it, I feel truly privileged today being uh, participating in this uh, conference and learning throughout the day from the distinguished um, speakers and panelists and being among uh, you. Uh, and I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to do so. Before uh, starting, I would like to share um, our sorrow for the loss of a great Helen, uh, a citizen of the world, uh, a role model for all of us, a major business leader with tremendous impact, the former chairman of the Hellenic Federation of Enterprises, former board of trustees at the American College of Greece, a member of our board of trustees at ALBA, Mr. Ulysses Kyriakopoulos. He's a role model for all of us. Now, I would like to share a few thoughts about precision in industry, or for parsimony, precision industry. We talk about, throughout the day today, about few major trends that are here to stay and grow. Technology in both aspects, both um, software, the Internet of Things, platforms, applications, and hardware, servers, drones, robots, and also data management, the collection of data from our behavior through all this technology, and analytics that gives us better understanding of human behavior. If you bring these trends together, then you move into what we call precision in industries. We talk about precision medicine, smart diagnostics that prevent disease, diagnostics that depend on the molecule, on the analysis of the molecule of the patient and the DNA of the patient that helps pharmaceutical companies develop pharmaceutical solutions that are focusing on the particular patient so that the treatment is customized to the patient, not one size fits all. Precision farming, drones and devices that really focus, get data on the humidity, on the climate of a particular field and gives back data, information to the farmer when to water the, to water the field, how to use um, fertilizers, conserve energy and resources to improve the yield of the crop. Precision manufacturing, laser cutting and molding, just an example, on how to customize the production of products based on the need. You might say, well, exotic. Not exotic. A lot of farmers in Greece are using precision farming. Several hospitals in Greece are participating in a consortia of research and development in developing new drugs using precision medicine. Several companies in Greece are using precision manufacturing. Why this is important? Why precision industry is very important? Because precision industry defies fundamental rules of economics. One of them, the trade-off between economies of scale one size fits all, and customization. Precision industry helps companies to achieve economies of scale. At the same time, they customize the products and the services to the end user. Second trade-off. When we usually reduce costs, we lose some of the value we are offering to the end user. Precision industry helps companies to reduce cost, become more efficient. At the same time, they develop 
solutions that are customized to the end user. In other words, precision industry will help us, will force us to rewrite the books in economics. And I'm an economist and I'm very happy about it. Now, this is a new trend. This and what we are talking about today, I really classify that as precision industry. It is growing. It's going to create tremendous value for the society because it reduces the usage of resources and increases the value to the end user, consumers, and so on, and requires a lot of investment. So investment to the next level. Precision industry. Thank you very much. So from, from, from Astipalia to precision industry, um, we're, we've covered a lot of ground and infrastructure on the way, and indeed real estate and digital. Um, we, have, we have perhaps 10 minutes if anybody wants to raise any, any questions uh, or make any comments or solve Michael's problem on infrastructure. Yes, please. Um, a microphone will come to you. Good afternoon. During uh, times of inflation, clients are advised to include in their portfolios uh, assets that have a, let's say, negative correlation with the mainstream markets. One of these uh, industry that um, it's good in times of inflation is real estate. But I was wondering, Yanni, uh, how do you believe that the uh, Russia Ukrainian war will impact the sector in Cyprus? Please. Well, it will definitely have an impact, <clears throat> as it will um, probably the real estate sector here in London also, <laughs> or the real estate sector in uh, southern European countries, or, or the retail market in London, or the, I don't know, the tourism industry in southern Europe as well. Um, it, it's not easy. When you isolate one of the world's biggest economies, it will have an impact. But imposing sanctions was the right thing to do. Maybe it's the price we have to pay for this terrible thing to, to end. But if we look at the, um, the real estate market in Cyprus alone and the impact from this war, maybe we're a, a little bit lucky that this comes at the back of two years of COVID. During these past two years, the Russian market was closed. We couldn't go to Russia to promote our projects. Russian buyers couldn't come to Cyprus. They wouldn't buy online. After all, it's real estate, so it's a significant investment. Nobody buys online, or very few people buy online. So we had to find alternative solutions, and we did find alternative solutions. So today's dependency on Russia is a probably lower than what one would expect. Uh, I wouldn't be worried about the buyer side, about the market side. I am worried about rising interest rates, inflation. Bank of England last week said that inflation will rise further and faster because of the war in Ukraine. I'm worried about energy prices, commodity prices, and the cost of construction material. I think the real, the, the real challenge in real estate today is to keep construction costs under control and probably to navigate through supply chain issues. So you don't have to delay or even stall real estate <clears throat> projects. And this is a global challenge today. Minister, do you want, you, you, I think you've raised your hand. Do you want to comment? You're not, no, we can't, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I said uh, for a moment I was tempted to get back on the discussion over inflation and the war Ukraine-Russia and how that affects uh, uh, imports and exports and real estate uh, market. But I suspect that you already talked about that throughout the day and it's going to be in the news in the coming few days, weeks, uh, months, hopefully not years. Uh, so I, I would like, with your permission, to go back to the innovative markets, innovative business uh, that we initially wanted to talk about. 
and and take a, a moment to uh, assess what was said by Leonidas out of the box and by Michalis concerns over infrastructure and where that leads us to and how decisions are being made in reference to the future of innovation in business and markets. Um, two, two very quick issues that I would like to address. The out of the box thinking of Leonidas is what I call leapfrog. And by leapfrogging, I mean that when you're in the place of a small country, Michalis, like Cyprus or Greece, uh, it's very similar to being in a competition with uh, multinational giants when you run a small business or a medium-sized business. And what do you do? Do you compete on the same grounds of what they do? No. You try to find a niche market on which to prosper and, and, and show your own uh, difference in, in what you do. So by leapfrogging and by thinking out of the box, which is the typical case of the Astipala project, you deliver to your country, to your business, to yourself, the feedback and the positive impact of something small that at the same time has a big value, a big change. Volkswagen and Greece in Astipalia deliver the very unique place where we bring uh, green energy, at the same time autonomous driving, and at the same time uh, electrification, and at the same time mobility on demand. Things that have never happened before in one place. And that difference made uh, big news throughout the world. And the impact is seen even today, because as we say in Greek, one good thing often leads to another. Uh, just to give you a very, very small example of what we did uh, 15 days ago, is that we decided to come up with a new, small, little, tiny program in Astipala, which is another example of leapfrogging and innovation business and market. As we were in Astipalia, we realized that there is hundreds of abandoned old tractors and buses and uh, cars and vehicles and, and, and bicycles and scooters. And we decided with the support of the municipality and the people to collect all of this, send it to a place where they can use it and actually sell it. And with the money that will be earned from cleaning up the island from all of this garbage, we will be delivering to the municipality a press for uh, for the garbage of the island. And so we do recycling on the spot by using the municipality, the people, the volunteers from all over the country uh, to do so. One good thing leads to another. Thinking out of the box, doing the leapfrogging is the exercise that brings innovation in your business through uh, a very particular way of thinking and making big news with little uh, means. That's that's pretty much what I wanted to share. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Are you ahead of Estonia? Not quite. <laughs> uh, not quite, but uh, I think we're getting there very quickly. Uh, so, yes, I would totally agree with the minister on that. Um, you know, I've worked for, for the Greek civil service for more than 15 years. So I know how it works, I know how it thinks, I know how it operates internally. I think it's the first time that I can see that from a governmental point of view, uh, we try to innovate ourselves. We are trying to do administrative innovation in order to be able to support innovation in the market, in the economy, in businesses. And if you see what I described uh, with the Festos Fund, which is a brand new idea that even the the commission said that it's very innovative and they will try to think about it. What the minister said about Astipalia, uh, what we've done um, during the pandemic, mm -hmm. some ideas that we implemented in order for uh, the pandemic to uh, to become more um, uh, to, to to face the difficulties of the pandemic. And, uh, and another thing that we've done, for example, we've done a big registry of uh, administrative procedures in Greece in order to have a rolling, a continuous assessment of the bureaucracy that businesses are facing, and the OECD wants to use it as a best practice uh, for other countries. I think it's the first time that Greece actually thinks, at least from a governmental point of view, I said, thinks out of the box, try and, tries to do the leapfrogging, uh, and produces things from this administrative point of view uh, that are good for the market. 
and that are good for the, the way the market works and supports innovation and everything. So yes, I would totally ad agree with the, with the minister on that and I hope that everybody else agrees with me as well because that's the main issue here. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure we solved the infrastructure problem. But, um. <laughs> no, not really. And, I, and, I'm, not, and I'm not sure, actually, um, if we are empowering the government with a sustainable way to have yeah. a constant flow of uh, funds to be able yeah. to keep investing in their countries. Yeah. So that's actually one of the questions that's out there on what I said before, because if the, the governments are keeping, uh, are keep working on, on, on credit lines and on lending or on limited um, tax inputs that actually come so they're able to spend, yes, it's going to be small projects trying to leapfrog out to be bigger. But what if we could empower that based on some uh, similarities of, let's say, I was actually having a discussion with some colleagues uh, a few hours ago about the Scandinavian model, mm. which can actually create more sustainable and long-term welfare states that are able to have happy citizens and able to give a long-term uh, efficiency on how they output everything. So, uh, and then you're asking, what are we meant to do with this currency, which keeps, I mean, we touched the issue of inflation. Yeah. So what are we doing with any currency globally? It's just being battered by inflation, and the government's like basically wor working on a, on, on a credit line as well. So if you're not actually getting from the output of the productivity in a country in order, in order to recycle the money and refeed it in, it's always going to be a dead end game at some point. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe the solution might be going back to technology innovation. That's why I'm just saying these things, thinking out of the box. Maybe it's the introduction of a new currency. Maybe it's something like the Central Bank of England is doing with stablecoin. Maybe it's a digital asset or maybe it's something else. But definitely, we are not appreciating what we currently have going around. Fair enough. One, one rule of thumb at The Economist is the answer to almost every problem is either Denmark or Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to add any last comment? Then we, because we need to move on. No, I think that uh, what, uh, what I'm thinking about is a, a kind of framework where all these are included. And when I talk about precision uh, industry, that's what I'm talking about. All these initiatives, innovation, and so on, they are focusing on creating more value for the end user using fewer resources. And this defies fund fundamental rules of economics. And I think that with the technology, we have this opportunity now. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much to all our panel and to our minister from, from Greece. Um, thank you.